Hello and welcome to the webinar on organic dry bean production and cultivar choices by Thomas Michaels, um, Craig Schaefer, Hannah Swigarden, and Claire Flavin of the University of Minnesota. My name is Alice Formiga and I'm the webinar coordinator for eOrganic. eOrganic is the organic agriculture community of practice with eExtension. You can find all of our published articles, videos, and our many upcoming and recorded webinars on organic farming and research topics on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore production. We're very excited to have some members of the dry bean research team at the University of Minnesota with us today. Tom Michaels is a professor of horticultural science whose research focus is dry bean genetics and breeding. Craig Schaefer, who will be joining us during the question and answer session, is a professor of agronomy and plant genetics whose research specialty is cropping systems. Hannah Swigarden and Claire Flavin are students in the Applied Plant Science Graduates Program whose thesis research projects address problems in organic dry bean cropping systems. Very good. Thanks so much, Alice. And thank you to all of you uh, out there uh, listening today. We really appreciate the opportunity to share with you uh, the research that we're doing and the results that we have today. As Alice mentioned, my name is Tom, Tom Michaels from the Department of Horticultural Science at the U of M. Uh, Craig will be along and join us later, and uh, Alice said you'll also be hearing from Claire and Hannah. Our webinar today focuses on the research we're doing in support of organic dry bean production, as the title says. The overall objective of our work, as you can see from the slide, is to offer growers an opportunity to diversify their organic cropping systems by including dry edible beans in their rotations. As, as another green legume so that it can be sold as a cash crop and be a viable alternative to soybeans, which would be more commonly found in that rotation. We're working on several research fronts, including agronomic strategies that promote efficient rotation, including work on weed control and nitrogen carryover in rotations that you'll hear about later today, as well as genetic strategies, such as identifying commercial dry beans that are particularly well suited to large-scale organic systems, and heirloom beans that may be of special interest to local urban markets, including, for instance, CSA shares and direct sales to institutions and to restaurants. In this introduction, I'm going to cover some of the basic aspects of beans for those of you uh, who are not particularly familiar with them. Then I'll turn the webinar over to Claire and Hannah to address our research projects here in Minnesota and the results that we have to date. So the crop that we're talking about is dry edible beans that have the Latin name Phaseolus vulgaris. Phaseolus vulgaris is a species with a great deal of variability and it's most noticeably expressed in the field by different plant habits, and also by a wide range of seed sizes, colors, and patterns. So just to address some of those differences that we see, some beans ex express the bean's ancestral plant habit, which is a vining habit, like pole beans, for instance, with which you may be familiar. Other types of beans have lost that vining tendency, but still have long internodes and tend to sprawl around on the ground. The most popular dry edible bean plant habit these days, I would say in commercial production though, is an upright, indeterminate bush type habit. Bush type habit because that makes it better adapted to mechanical harvest. Some of the older varieties that you might have found in the 50s and 60s would have had a, de a determinate plant habit that was also a bush, but the indeterminates tend to have a little bit better yield potential. Bean seeds vary from the quite large seeds of types ancestral to the Andes, like kidney beans, for instance, to the much smaller white navy beans that trace their ancestry to Mexico. You are already likely aware of the great differences in seed colors and patterns that are associated with dry beans. Most, notice, most noticeably, I'd say, in commercial beans, in cranberry beans with the beautiful red markings on a cream background, and pinto beans with a brown marking on a somewhat tan or cream background as well. 
there are also uh, heirloom beans uh, such as Sol Soldier or Jacob's Cattle or Calypso that have other types of markings. As the name says, dry beans are harvested when the seeds are dry, but snap beans or green beans like you might grow in your garden or canners might uh, grow or for freezing, uh, which are harvested when the pods are fleshy and seeds immature, are really the same species as dry beans, Phaseolus vulgaris but with major modifications, of course, to lower pod fibers and higher sugar content in the pods. Beans are particularly important to organic rotations because they are legumes and can fix nitrogen. Although work done by others has shown that they're not as efficient an end fixer as, for instance, soybeans. End fixation, when I look at a bean field, seems to kick in, or at least the plants begin to look more green in the field, several weeks after planting when the plants have set roughly their fifth node and they're beginning to think about producing flower buds. Then you can really see the field start to green up. Conventional dry bean producers commonly apply a starter fertilizer at planting to provide nitrogen and other nutrients to the seedlings during that period before tin fixation kicks in. But of course organic producers must rely on manures and rotations to provide the end that can be absorbed by those young plant roots. We have here a slide showing several of the major market classes of beans that are grown in the Minnesota and North Dakota region. The highest production class region-wide would be pinto, followed by uh, navy and black beans. Kidney beans are up there because they are particularly important in Minnesota. Edible soy is on this list, even though it's a relatively minor crop. It's one crop that we use as a, another possibility for an, an edible crop off of the organic rotation. And also it's a good comparison for our beans for things like end fixation and for yield and also for architecture. We also have heirloom beans uh, up here, even though they are very small acreage, mostly uh, small plots and gardens because, frankly, because of their poor adaptation to uh, mechanized harvest. The bean, though, that we're showing in the bottom right is a bean called tiger eye. And it's particularly endearing to us because its colors are also our school colors, maroon and gold. If you were to draw a line from the southeast corner of Minnesota down by Iowa and Wisconsin, up to the northwest corner by Manitoba and North Dakota, you would very roughly diagonally divide the state into the historic prairie soils in the southwest triangle of the state and the historic forest soils in the northeast triangle in the state. And of course, there's going to be a transition zone in between. Bean production in Minnesota is concentrated in the central west and northwest parts of the state, especially in that transition zone between the prairie soils and the forest soils. Acreage in Minnesota is roughly around the 150,000 acre mark uh, with average yields of roughly uh, 1,700 pounds or uh, colloquially 17 bags of beans per acre. Uh, in, the North, in North Dakota, by the way, our, our neighbor state, there's more bean production and the uh, total acreage might be up as high as 750,000 acres. According to one dealer I called last year, conventional beans uh, were selling, conventional dry beans were selling for in the neighborhood of $35 to $50 a bag, which is really a high price compared to the prices of about 18 to 20 that I was seeing uh, back in the 1990s. And he also mentioned that organic beans were selling for double that price, so up around $70 to $100 a bag, with a particularly strong market available for organic black beans. In terms of planting and harvest, where do these fit in with the system? Beans are typically planted after corn and soybeans are in, uh, around June 1, and I don't get nervous until June 15. Uh, and harvested before corn and soybeans, typically in mid to late September. So they fit in after corn and soybeans for the planting, but before corn and soybeans, typically for harvest time. 
Now, I like working with beans because I can take them home and eat them, unlike, say, working with alfalfa. And I say that as a dig to Craig because he works also with forage crops. But I like working with crops that I can eat. So the reason I bring that up is the key is that dry beans are a food crop. The crop can be processed, typically, for instance, into canned beans, but they can also be sold to consumers dry for cooking at home. That means that roughly there are two types of markets. There's a market toward a commercial crop that's mostly directed to processing, and there's also a local crop, or the possibility of a, a local crop that's mostly consumed by home cooks, in restaurants, and also by institutions. The reason I mention this is an organic bean grower can then make some decisions about to direct, how to direct his or her crop toward either of these fundamental marketing streams. And that depends somewhat, though, on the variety of bean that's grown. As noted earlier, as a great legume that fixes its own nitrogen, beans can also play an important role in diversifying organic rotations. In this slide, we have a table that compares some of the major nutritional contributions of dry bean, soybean, and corn. And you can see uh, that dry beans, in this case kidney beans, stack up particularly well. Beans have a little bit less protein content than soybean per 100 grams, but on a per calorie basis, it's equal to soybean. And the fiber content, which along with the protein is one of the chief nutritional features of beans, is very high. Beans are also low in fat and low in cholesterol. And I should mention that recent changes to the school lunch program have mandated that students receive in their lunches the equivalent of a half cup of dry pulse crops like dry beans each week. And this particularly opens up new opportunities for farm to school bean sales. In addition to the potential for a commercial organic bean crop in Minnesota, we're particularly interested in the role that locally produced dry edible beans can play in local nutrition. As you'll see later, if we can build a market for locally produced beans, then we think there's an opportunity to expand the production of heirloom beans, which is important to consumers because of the demand then for the unique sizes, unique colors, and patterns that these different, uh, these heirloom beans provide. When I read the National Organic Program Crop Rotation Standard, I find that it's vague about the number of crops re required in the rotation. However, it is specific that the rotation must maintain or improve soil organic matter and manage deficiencies or excesses in nutrients, as well as manage pests and provide erosion control. From the soil nutrient standpoint, bean as a legume is a good choice of a crop that will not mine nitrogen from the soil and might even add a bit back. For a producer, a diverse set of crash crops, including dry bean in the rotation, could also reduce produ production risks from low diversity. So in short, we're looking for ways that organic producers can add dry beans to their rotation to meet the National Organic Program standards, but also make sure that the dry bean crop is productive enough to provide a good return for the grower's investment. Frankly, I can't do a talk like this without showing my favorite part of the plant, which is the root. I think personally that healthy roots that resist disease and support a high number of effective nodules are key and essential aspects of bean varieties that are well adapted to organic systems. Here I've got a picture of a reasonably healthy bean root where there are where, where two of the three types of roots, and that's the tap fruit that you see heading uh, down uh, vertically and some basal roots that are heading off horizontally are both supporting a, a high number of nodules at a stage that when I look at that root, I would expect the top part of the plant is probably well into pod fill. The only thing lacking in this root are strong hypocotyl roots. And those, those uh, occur between where the basils attach and where they 
hypocolor emerges from the soil, those are roots that mine the upper portions of the soil profile and get at nutrients that aren't mobile in water. This particular root has fewer, but some have strong hypocondyl roots that are also modulated. This root in general looks great, but frankly, having dug a lot of roots in the field, not all roots look this good. So we're done with the introduction, and now I'm going to turn this presentation over to Claire and Hannah. In particular, Claire is going to take this forward, and the two of them are going to walk you through some of the Minnesota research that we're doing. And I'll join you again at the end for our conclusion. So Claire, you want to take it from here? Sure, Tom. Um, like Tom mentioned, now we'll move on to research we're conducting at the University of Minnesota uh, to address some of these objectives that we mentioned earlier, like developing the production strategies and breeding programs for these edible dry beans. First of all, it's important to note the characteristics of the organic system in which we're conducting the research in which farmers will actually be growing the beans. So Tom talked about this a little bit um, because we think it's important to take into consideration these characteristics that make an organic system more unique than a conventional system. For example, an organic system might have more diverse crop rotations, use more mechanical weed control, as well as use organic fertilizers such as turkey compost manure as opposed to uh, the inorganic nitrogen applications. Um, so these characteristics can create a unique environment for crops and while some research doesn't focus on breeding under these conditions, we think it's important for the future farm applicability of our research on these farms. So here's a look at our various research projects pertaining to the dry beans. We are conducting this research at research, um, at university research sites as well as on farm sites. And our research seeks to investigate the different effects of these characteristics that I mentioned earlier by evaluating management practices as well as different bean varieties, both market class and heirloom beans. Um, the different Research projects you can see um, include weed control, rotation benefits, variety evaluation, heirloom breeding, and later we'll also discuss a market analysis of the dry beans in Minnesota. Um, but first let's talk about our experiment pertaining to weed control in organic dry bean systems. Muted. Um, in organic systems, farmers it seems tend to be a little bit creative with their weed management. Uh, the farmers I've spoken with have a few different types of cultivators meant for ma managing weeds at different stages. Two examples I've provided here are a field cultivator, which you can see on the left, and a picture on the right depicts a tine weeder. While a tine, or sorry, while a field cultivator is more aggressive, a tine weeder can be a powerful intra-row tool, especially early in the season. So those little bars that you can see hanging off the back of the tine weeder will actually go right over the plant, um, you know, say the beans, it'll go right over the beans and take out the weeds at a young stage, exposing their roots. But you can use both of those at different times of the year. Our weed management experiment looks at the effects of row spacing as well as the tillage method on weed biomass. In these experiments, uh, we conducted them at two locations and we included three different varieties, the, a black bean, a kidney bean, as well as a soybean. And you can see the three treatments. We have tine weeding on 15 inch rows cultivation and tying weeding on 30 inch rows, and then finally cultivation on 30 inch rows. The preliminary data from last year suggest that the weed biomass was significantly affected by tillage, variety, and the interaction between the two. So the weed biomass 
we saw an effect um, on what sort of tillage we use, whether we were using a field cultivator or a tine weeder, the results were different, as well as different varieties might respond better to either a different row spacing or a cultivation method. And another result indicated that tine weeding of plots with 15 inch rows had greatest effect on weeds. However, like I said, this is just preliminary data and the weather patterns that we experienced last year were very different than the ones we experienced this year. Last year it was very dry and this year it's been very wet um, and so we've overall seen more weeds in the field in general. So we may see that come through in the results, um, but I guess I'll stress the importance here of continued and multi-year research here for agronomic systems. The next experiment is designed to look at the rotation benefits, if any, that may exist in a three-year rotation of alfalfa or corn, followed by dry beans and then wheat. The rotation experiment taking place at five locations has three treatments, the first being what the first year crop is. That could be corn or it could be alfalfa. And then the second treatment would be the bean variety as a second year crop. Um, and we did include a variety of each type of category that we've been talking about black, pinto, soy, kidney, heirloom, or navy bean in this experiment. And finally, we are also looking at the nitrogen and bean effect on the wheat. Um, to kind of go over the nitrogen a little bit more, we will um, indeed be applying a variable night of nitrogen, sorry, of nitrogen to the wheat fields before we plant. Um, it will include a control of applying no nitrogen and then 30, 60, or 90 pounds of an organic nitrogen source will be applied because we're looking at the inequivalency provided by either the nitrogen um, and the nitrogen equivalency from either the alfalfa or the beans in the system. And next you'll see what the rotation will look like with either corn or beans in the first year, then the field beans, followed by wheat. We are expecting that the wheat and bean yields will be higher following alfalfa due to its nitrogen fixing capabilities as it is also a legume. Moreover, because the alfalfa creates more of a ground cover than row planted corn, for example, we expect there to be fewer weeds or at least weeds of a, di of a different type, say broadly for grasses. But we'll also have to see what comes of the data from this year. And the next experiment um, that I'm working on evaluates the yield and quality of 24 market class varieties. And by market class varieties, we mean beans that are already commercially available as opposed to heirloom beans, which Hannah will talk about in a moment. So these market class variety trials, which included the six different types of beans also, um, took place at five locations this year. We looked at the yield and quality of the beans, days to harvestable maturity. And so yes, that includes us going out to the different plots at different times whenever those beans were ready to harvest them. Um, and we also looked at the early plant vigor because this could play into weed competition for the plant later in the year. So we looked at all of these over 24 different varieties and um, this graph from last year shows the stability and yield of the different varieties over the four locations. On the x-axis, you can see the coefficient of variation, which is the standard deviation of varieties mean, uh, the mean yield across locations. And that's then standardized over the mean 
So the least, if you see a value that is low in a coefficient of variation, it means they have the least standard deviation across those locations. and are effectively more stable. Um, and then on the y-axis, you see the mean yield in bu bushels per acre. So essentially, the lower the CV and the higher the mean, the more stable the variety. And the varieties then in the top left box might be the most desirable. Uh, for example, from this data, um, you can see that there are a few different beans in that box. So there's a soy bean, which we just call soy A here. There's an OAC rex, which is a navy bean. Lariat, which is a pinto bean. Zorro is a black bean. And then that MSU number one is a navy bean. So I guess if we had to give any recommendations, we might suggest those. However, this is very preliminary and um, you know, it could be very different this year and also very regionally, you know, depending on your location, weather conditions, soil conditions. So hopefully we'll have another webinar and we'll tell you what happens from this year. But right now I'm going to turn it over to Hannah and she can tell us about her varietal work with heirloom beans. So another component of our work centers on the evaluation and selection of superior heirloom cultivars. And this is really an exciting part of the project for me to be working on, as heirloom beans are relatively unexplored in terms of their agronomic morphological characteristics and their marketability. Um, and what we're finding is that there is a lot of interest in both the production and the sale of heirloom beans. Um, but I think before we delve too far into the details of the project, I think it's important to point out that by and far the question I receive most frequently about this research is what is an heirloom bean? And despite a year of research under my belt, the answer remains relatively elusive. Um, the more I search for a definition of heirloom, the more I find myself questioning its applicability to the context of the seed. If we think about it, the seed itself, it's a living, respiring entity, and as a result, the lifespan and the viability of the seed is, is finite. Um, now, according to Merriam-Webster's definition of an heirloom, whether it's a seed or another valuable sort of object, the heirloom has to transcend time and be passed from one generation to the next. So, as a result, I think the definition of an heirloom needs to be extended to a cultural context in which the seed is a component part. Um, and in my opinion, the best definition of heirloom actually comes from the Seed Savers Exchange website in, in Iowa, um, where they define an heirloom as, uh, or heirlooms as old varieties still maintained by gardeners and farmers, particularly in isolated or ethnic communities. Um, this definition not only highlights the maintenance necessary to, to cross or transcend generations, but it also hints at another important facet of heirlooms is that we know very little about them because they were growing in these isolated or regionally adapted communities. Um, but what we have been able to deduce about heirlooms, heirloom beans, are that they first and foremost have bold, identifiable seed coat colors and patterns. We also know that given their regional adaptation, um, have resulted in unique tastes catered to regional dishes, such as Boston baked beans or tiger's eye cassoulet. I guess I just made that one up, but I'm going to make it a Minnesota culinary treat. Um, and lastly, we typically have a nice one or two sentence tagline associated with each cultivar that describes its unique history. Um, for example, we see the story of Hutter the Hutterite religious group's immigration from Austria in the mid-1700s. That's just a really quick byline in the historical description of the bean. Um, but given that they have been maintained in relatively isolated communities, the pedigree and historical records are typically minimal, sometimes anecdotal, or missing altogether. So really what we're left with as researchers is what the seeds and, and their plants can tell us. In order to delve further into the agronomic characteristics of these beans, we needed to run some basic evaluation and yield trials. 
This past summer, we ran yield trials at four uh, CSAs, or Community Supported Agriculture Businesses, around the Twin Cities metro. And what we found can be illustrated on, uh, on the following graph, which um, plots the coefficient of variation along the x-axis um, against the average yield, and I think this is in kilograms per acre, on the y-axis. Uh, much like the stability analysis that Claire presented earlier, we would like to see a cultivar that's high yielding and has relatively low CV across locations. Um, but what we found, however, was that heirlooms were generally poor performers in comparison to these pink checks located in the upper left-hand quadrant. Um, they also exhibited a higher level of variation across locations, indicating they're not generally adapted to many environments. But this variation really isn't all bad. Uh, variation is the key to making gain from selection in breeding programs. So the second part of our evaluations focused on the evaluation of variation within an heirloom cultivar. cultivar. Uh, we looked at 14 different heirloom cultivars, which are pictured here. Um, and we measured variation across nine different plant traits, including plant height, uh, number of pods, plant yield, um, etc. And we found that heirlooms retain quite a bit of variation, and that variation we then used to select superior lines from within the cultivars. Um, this upcoming growing season, which seems a long time from now, um, will consist of replicated evaluation trials to establish what sort of gain or improvement can be made within an heirloom cultivar without actually interfering with the integrity of the cultivar's genotype or its historical significance to a region. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there is quite a bit of interest in these heirlooms from both a production and a marketability standpoint. And our selection work not only, um, we hope, not only results in an improved cultivar line for growers, but uh, it would help to fill the demand for local beans. And I'm not making up this demand just because I've somehow convinced myself that heirloom beans are awesome. Um, but the demand is actually supported by surveys sent to Minnesota CSAs, driving distributors, and co-ops. Um, the lo this local market analysis was a partnership between the Department of Agronomy at the U University of Minnesota and the Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships. Um, the surveys sent out were meant to evaluate avenues to incorporate dry beans into the local food system. And I really have to mention two key players in this research, Kathy Drager, um, the statewide director for the Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships, and Greg Schweitzer, the associate director for Sustainable Local Foods. The survey, these surveys were really um, their brainchild, and the relatively new results offer some terrific insight into the supply chain and the marketability of local beans. Uh, the first of the surveys were sent to CS on, CSA owners this May uh, um, in Minnesota regarding general, their general operations, uh, their current and past bean production, and dry bean production with regard to their CSA shares. Uh, and this is an interesting outlet to explore, primarily because CSA operation is one of the most direct routes to the customer available. In terms of marketability and supply chain, it, it doesn't get much more straightforward than either having the customer come out to your farm or delivering their share right, right to their doorstep. Um, over half of the respondents had grown dry beans before, uh, whether it was for personal consumption, commercial sale, or both. And it's also interesting to note that 83% of respondents had considered growing dry beans for their CSH shares, but only about half had actually pre, um, distributed dry beans through their CSA shares in the past. Um, growers noted several barriers to small-scale bean production, such as quality issues, labor-intensive processing, and difficulty setting an adequate price share that reflected the processing and market value of local dry beans. In general, however, the, the results from these surveys are optimistic with regard to dry bean production in CSAs. Uh, perhaps the most convincing argument for 
a market demand appears in the results from the survey sent to managers and bulk buyers from co-ops in both North Dakota and Minnesota. Um, respondents indicated that there was an opportunity for small producers to enter the supply chain, excuse me, to enter the supply chain by selling directly through co-ops. Now this was provided that um, the grower was able to provide regular shipments of quality product to keep the, the, the shelves stocked at the co-ops. Um, but niche market or specialty types of beans such as local, organic, or heirloom varieties seem to elicit the most interest from these buyers. And in fact, some, some co-ops would consider a markup reduction if the beans were sourced lo locally. But overwhelmingly, managers noted that locally sourced heirloom beans would most likely fulfill an unmet demand within the co-ops. Um, the specialty demand would benefit small producers that are either unwilling or unable to compete with market classes that serve already as a staple food product in the co-ops. Now, the inability of a small producer to compete with the production and sale of market class dry beans can be attributed to a multitude of different factors, but one very important one was that both large grocery stores and co-ops often purchase their beans from distributors or centralized distribution centers that sell to processors or bulk markets. In general, distributors prefer large quantities of a quality product, which is a major constraint to small-scale production. But in order to better understand the role of distributors in the supply chain, um, Personal interviews were conducted with nine of the 14 bean distributors in Minnesota. Uh, two of the participating distributors were willing and currently do distribute organic dry beans, but this is in a very limited capacity and making up a very small percent of their total sales. Uh, when asked about possibly distributing heirloom or specialty varieties, only one responded positively, citing the need for established markets, that is, the grower would have to establish their market and a relationship with the grower prior to the distribution of these specialty types. In general, I guess the, the results of the distributor report were rather dismal with regard to small-scale production and distribution of dry beans, but this means that small-scale and organic growers would like, likely need to seek out more direct markets um, for their specialty dry beans. But partnerships with these distributor, distributors, however, could be very beneficial to growers that are able to produce large quantities, as distributors can offer markets and agronomic services to farmers. Um, but I think these three surveys sent out to CSAs, co-ops, and distributors really highlighted the need for an increased understanding of the local market for dry beans. In particular, the direct, the direct routes that may be used by small growers of niche market varieties. Um, we would like to look into um, the supply chain leading to schools, restaurants, farmers markets, and even non-co-op grocery stores because these avenues are really key to implementing the findings and results of our work. Um, with that, I think, I think we're kind of reaching the end, but I'd like to pass it back to Tom so we can talk about some of our future work and where we're going to be headed from here. Great, thanks, Anna. Let me see if I can pull up our next slide here. No pre presentation would be complete without talking about what our future work uh, is going to be, of course. So I'd like to note in this slide that uh, our work's going to expand the market analysis that Anna just uh, introduced, particularly with regard to local markets. And Hannah will also be examining the genetic diversity of her heirloom beans using modern molecular methods. We're going to compare the uh, effect of bean cultivar and trial location on nutritional composition of seeds beginning this year. And then lastly, uh, we're enlisting, as we speak, uh, Twin Cities chefs to provide us with culinary evaluations of the heirloom beans. In closing, I wanted to mention how grateful we are to the USDA, to the Ceres Trust, to North Central SARE, and the University of Minnesota for supporting our work. And we are very pleased that you joined us for this webinar. 
Yes, thank you. Um, we have quite a few questions coming in already. Hey, um, someone wanted to clarify um, whether organic dry beans have really gotten um, $100 per um, bushel, and is that a high price for direct sale retail? Well, my jaw dropped when I heard that. <laughs> Uh, but the it, the black beans were not the ones receiving the hundred dollars. It was kidneys. Uh, so the black beans were coming in at about thirty five at that time per bag per hundred pounds, commercial uh, conventional crop, and double was was roughly seventy. So that also made my jaw drop though because those are those are big numbers. So my understanding in talking with with this uh, dealer that yes that was the price. As I was uh, preparing my comments yesterday, one of the things I couldn't remember for the life of me was whether that was Farmgate or whether that was what the distributor was getting. Uh, so there may be a discount from that from Far Farmgate, but I'm, I just cannot remember for sure. So there may be someone in the audience who knows more what the prices are looking at now. Uh, but it was the larger seeded beans, which frankly are uh, more difficult to produce in that they can be a bit high, uh, lower yield and because of their large seed size are more prone to seed damage. So seed quality issues are a bit uh, uh, more important. Those larger seeded beans were the ones that were and probably will continue to command the highest prices. Um, okay, yeah, we had a question about a good um, black bean variety to grow in south central Iowa where they've got clay soils and wet springs and hot dry summers and also whether there are fung fungal issues in this area as with soybeans. All right, well with, with black beans, the first thing I want to mention about black beans is that if I were making a recommendation to an organic uh, producer for insertion of a crop in their rotation where they don't have much experience with dr growing dry edible beans, I would right away recommend black beans. So what I'm getting at in a roundabout way is saying black beans are a great choice for starting. So the question is more which one? Uh, and we have had experience with two, and you may recall the uh, uh, CV and yield chart that Claire was describing, and you may recall two beans on there that we've been testing, Zorro and Eclipse. And those we find seem to be stable across years and also are uh, pretty high yielding. So I can say with some confidence, you know, mitigated by the fact that that graph was only one year data, but we've had more experience with them than just that. Those are pretty good beans. Uh, uh, they stand up well, they're vigorous, they come out of the ground well. And uh, although they, I have not specifically tested and fixation with them, as a black bean, I'd expect them to be uh, pretty darn good. But your region is different than uh, where we have been doing our testing, which has been central and uh, west central Minnesota. And so probably uh, one, area, one place that I want you to consult is to take a look at the trials that have been done and are published by North Dakota State. They have a website that has uh, uh, summarize the, their trial information and they run, I believe, the most extensive trials around that would include black beans, although I haven't looked at the Nebraska data, but certainly way more than we do. And so that's a rich place to take a look at data and look at possibly some of the very newest varieties that are coming out of NDSU and also out of Michigan State uh, that may be available. So uh, that's kind of a way of punting in saying that we've looked at two, they're both good, but I'd look at the NDSU data and, and I uh, certainly support your thoughts about starting out with uh, black beans because I think they're a good bet. So the second part of the question had to do with uh, uh, fungal diseases, is that right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so when I think of uh, fungal diseases, the one that jumps out at me right away is white mold, simply because it's the most widely reported fungal disease problem that we get in this area. And I've got quite a bit of experience in uh, Ontario as well, and it was a problem there, and it's a problem in Michigan. It's just a problem where you have uh, moisture around beans, which is uh, most places. So uh, I would look at white mold, and there, uh, there are no varieties that really are labeled as resistant. It's more that they have some avoidance measures, commonly uh, high vigor 
that allows the plants to, to tolerate some incidence of disease but still yield well. And again, since we were talking about black beans earlier, I consider them to be fairly vigorous to this disease. I, I don't know of any bean breeders that aren't working on trying to discover really strong sources of white mold, but right now we have to deal more with tolerance and avoidance. Two other uh, fungal diseases that are of concern, uh, one is rust, where you get into drier areas, then rust can be a problem. We don't see it in Minnesota or haven't in the last four years, but there are years when uh, bean rust is a problem and there is strong resistance to it. Uh, but again, you, one thing I would consult if I were looking is I'd look at the NDSU data and take a look at which varieties are rated as having good uh, uh, rust resistance. Uh, the other uh, fungal disease that's on the horizon for me is anthracnose, bean anthracnose. There are a number of different races. It reminds me a lot, lot of uh, wheat rust in the fact that there are lots of different races and lots of different genes that are deployed. Uh, but anthracnose can be a, a real problem just burning off the crop in some areas, and then it goes away for a while. So I was talking to some of my colleagues in Ontario where they're having some difficulty with anthracnose right now, uh, but we haven't seen any. So uh, those are the three, when you talk about fungal diseases, number one on my list uh, by a wide margin would be white mold, uh, followed by rust in drier areas, and then anthracnose in, in spotty locations. Okay, um, we have a number of questions coming in. Um, the the next two are about um, weed control. Um, the first one was um, how you control um, black nightshade when it comes in with certified seed. And um, the second one is um, if whether any of you are familiar with the weed flaming research um, done by um, UNL and uh, South Dakota State University um, using flamers at the fifth node in dry edible beans. Yeah. Uh, Claire or Hannah, do you want to take that or do you want me to continue? Uh, you go for it, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to start with the last one. Uh, it, one of the reasons I was handing it off to uh, Claire and Hannah is because it's not my area of expertise, but I do go by what I hear from growers. And when I bring up the flaming research, I, I, get, I get these um, it really interesting looks from growers who have had some experience with it and say, yes, it can work, uh, but uh, it really depends on the year and the crop and stage, stage, stage is so important. So I, I hate to say any more because I haven't gone, gone out and done it and done research on it, but what I've heard is that it can work, uh, but also that it can not work if, if it isn't uh, uh, just at the right stage. With regard to the nightshade coming in on certified seed, I just groaned when I heard that because seed issues uh, are a problem, uh, especially when we're taking a look at organic seed. Uh, I think we might have a question here also about maybe some uh, diseases that come in with uh, dry beans, like common bacterial blight. I think a lot of these things can be addressed by trying to develop a high quality seed production uh, system that growers can plug into. I know I have trouble plugging into a, a really good seed system. I think they're building, uh, but uh, I think they could be stronger as well. So uh, with that, I'm going to avoid the question a bit because I don't know what to do about nightshade coming in with certified seed, except to say we're going to try, especially when we identify heirlooms that are particularly good, to set up a, a good certified seed system in Minnesota and region that can uh, provide a very high quality seed that's disease and, and weed free. Okay, um, yeah, we did have a question about sources of virus free or virus resistant heirloom seeds. So, um, yeah, I don't know if you if want to. If I can to just say just one more thing about mm -hmm. that, uh, again, to show my ignorance, I'm going out to the, um, the uh, Organic Seed Alliance's meeting, and I think it's at the end of January, to and one of the things, uh, while I'm there to discuss other issues, I hope that what I'll be able to plug into there is more information about where the good seed supplies are and what we need to do nationally to try to prov provide a uh, network uh, that growers can plug into to get good seeds. So there are organizations that are working on this. 
Uh, and so I think if we can get that network going, uh, we'll be in better shape in a couple of years than we are right now. Okay. Um, we have a few questions about the heirloom trials. Um, the first one is um, kind of what your growing methods were, specifically whether or not you trellised them and how that affected your cultivation methods if you did. Right, so actually we didn't trellis any of our um, genotypes. We set in our in our yield trials and evaluations, we grew 19 different um, cultivars. However, in our selection work, um, we decided to toss out those uh, genotypes that were vining or sprawling, um, as we were looking for more of a bush type architecture. Um, so no trellising was done there. Okay. Um, Let's see. Um, here's one for Claire. Um, Claire, you mentioned that in preliminary results, um, variety had an impact on weeds. Um, what varieties or what characteristics did those varieties tend to exhibit? I might actually pass this over to Craig. Craig's with us now. Okay. Yeah, hi there. I just arrived. Um, <laughs> and I don't know as much about the um, um, actual varietal differences. Tom did, I, I think he left, but um, here's the dilemma we have with these beans um, and particularly related to soybeans um, is that the architecture is, stop, is, is such and the our growth ham, habit is such that so they have a very poor canopy closure. And the reason that Tom recommended the black turtle bean is that because it has a more upright canopy and it does give more shading of the soil between the rows or even within the rows uh, to, to uh, control weeds. So um, that's one that we've clearly identified the black turtle beans as having uh, uh, more competitiveness ability with weeds. Okay, um, we have several questions coming in about processing. Um, I guess two of the questions are more or less the same here. Um, do you have any um, tips or advice for small scale um, processors? Right, so I think that's a, um, a, huge deterring a huge deterring factor for small scale growers. Um, and unfortunately, there's, there's not a lot of remedy. Um, unless you have some sort of engineering background or can piece to hodgepodge together um, a nice belt thresher of some sort or a small scale thresher, it's difficult. Um, I would, however, encourage any small scale growers to look at the WSU website. Um, they have managed to build a relatively cheap uh, thresher that would help with processing um, in, in terms of breaking the pods from the seeds. Um, but in terms of seed sorting and seed cleaning, there's really not a lot of outlets. Um, most growers that we've talked to in Minnesota have been fortunate enough to kind of uh, stumble upon old machinery or equipment that just happened to work, such as gra gravity sorters. Um, and at doing research, we ended up doing most of it by hand anyway. So um, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of good news, but it's something to look into and um, definitely something looking, uh, that needs more research and attention. Okay, um, what about um, harvesting um, techniques? Um, I know um, we've had a number of questions about that. Like, um, I'm trying to find the question just a moment because um, there was, okay, hang on. Yeah, but do you have any recommendations on harvesting equipment and um, the process of harvesting for small scale, scale growers? Um, most small scale growers that I know actually will do their harvesting by hand. Okay, that yeah, here's so the question, sorry. Um, whether it was clipping or pulling and winnowing before combining, do you have any comments on that? Right, if you, if you have the equipment available um, and then you're large enough to have, uh, be able to winrow and direct combine that way, um, that would definitely be the recommended method. However, most small growers don't have that available to them. Um, so we're finding that growers will either go through and pull their plant, their whole plants, and then put them through a th large threshing machine, or 
um, growers will actually go out and pod pick. And I have, uh, with these heirlooms that don't quite have the architecture we're looking for yet, um, pod picking has been what we've we've chosen to do, given their large seed size and um, unadapted or unbred, I should say, architecture. Okay, yeah, there was a question about that, whether there's a difference in harvesting and processing equipment for market class and for heirloom varieties. Yeah, we're, we're struggling to find some uh, proper equipment for these heirlooms because they are typically larger seeded than most market class varieties. Okay. Um, yeah, we had a comment about um, the tiger eye bean, um, that it's mm -hmm. not, you know, the different characteristics of the heirloom beans. And for example, that one isn't suitable for cassoulet because it falls apart with long cooking. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for that. I'm not a very good chef in the first place. <laughs> um, okay, so here's a question about what type of soils um, dry beans prefer and which varieties uh, might do best without irrigation. Um, well, I can speak about my heirlooms. Um, in general, dry beans are going to like a really well-drained soil um, that has, uh, in the organic systems at least, gone through quite a bit of rotation. Um, but none of my heirlooms were irrigated this past year and yielded reasonably well. Um, I think without irrigation, you're also getting earlier uh, maturation, and we definitely saw that. But um, the ti tiger's eye actually did quite well um, inter without irrigation, yielded, yielded well. We also saw um, Mylena Cisco's did pretty well without irrigation. So it, it's possible. However, I don't have a lot of exper experience with irrigation. I don't know if Claire or Craig can speak to that in the market class trials. Or if they're here. We didn't have any irrigation on our plots either. Um, so I can't necessarily speak to the differences between yields with irrigation or without irrigation. Um, but I think we did have a variety of different types of soils, whether they were sandy and, um, you know, would let water flow through them easier or if they were more compact. But um, I think the, the weather also had an input on it, you know, we have plots far out west as well as, um, you know, pretty close to campus here. So the weather patterns could change. And I honestly don't know if we had more rain at one place or the other. But I can't speak necessarily to varietal difference. Yeah, I think that in terms of soil selection, I think that, uh, you know, you really don't want a soil which is poorly drained. But our trials have been over a number of locations, different kinds of soils. And it's typical water is a limiting factor, but the big problem is those dang weeds. Give me a soil without weeds and you'll have a good situation. Okay, um, here's a question about when you use your tine weeder. Um, do you use it pre-emergence or how long after emergence? So, um, I don't know if you talked about that. Did you talk about the timing of the tine weeder? I did a little bit. Okay, and and it was you can do it pre and post emergence. Um, if the crop is you know like three inches tall, even I think you could still run the tine weeder over it. But a uh, tine weeding you know pass through before emergence is also I think recommended. And I think they did three to four tine weedings over the years. And um, I wasn't here for the data presentation, but. We've got to be honest, you know, we've done one, one, two years now of tine weeding. The first year where we had warm spring and early emergence of weeds, the tine weeding, early tine weeding really worked well. So did cultivation, but tine weeding worked a little better. This year, where everything was delayed, we had issues with tine weeding as well as cultivation. But tine weeding gets you the opportunity to do those in a row weeds and it is effective at doing that. So and it again three to four times after those you know the weeds were in the seedling stage and it ripped them out. You can't can't let them get very big. Okay um, do you have any recommendations for sourcing um, heirloom seeds um, or in, where did the heirloom varieties that you planted come from? Right our original stock actually came from um, 
I suppose what you would call commercial seed savers. Um, is that such as Seed Savers Exchange in Iowa, Vermont Bean Company, Purcell Mountain. Um, and I don't, the resistance genes really haven't been bred into heirloom cultivars for the most part. Um, so even those that we source were not disease free. We have major issues with common bacterial blight, which is a seed borne disease. Um, and very few heirlooms will have the I gene or the gene um, that provides resistance to um, common bean mosaic virus. Um, unfortunately, I guess I don't have a lot of recommendations on where you can get guaranteed disease free seed um, until we decide to breed those into it. I, I'm not sure they exist. If anyone does know, I, I'd be. Okay. Yeah, feel um, free to type excited. into the comment mm -hmm. um, box any recommendations for good sources of heirloom bean seed. Um, for, I don't know if any of you can address that this question from a food safety standpoint, what are some of the challenges that small growers face and how might they be overcome? Food safety. Um, I guess I'll say that one of the one of the good things about these dry beans is they are dry. You know, they have a longer shelf life than some of the, the fresh produce that some of these small growers are working with. Um, so I just say their kind of storability and their ability to keep fresh because they're dry eliminate some of those food safety problems. Um, but you know there are still, I suppose, some of the the diseases, diseases that we've been talking about, but those aren't transferable to humans. So um, yeah, I'm not sure of any either. Sorry. Okay. Um, what is the planting rate for black beans, and is there a difference between that and other beans? I'll try to answer that. Tom uh, has worked more on those planting rates, and I would defer to um, whatever local uh, recommendations there are, and it's usually a certain population per foot of row. Do you know, Claire, what, they, what we use? Not exactly. I think it was uh, two and a half inch spacing between each plant, and I'm not exactly sure what, you know, how that would pan out over acreage or for the whole farm. So if you had a, so Hannah, maybe you want to comment, what populations did you use black beans in your heirloom trials? Uh, we actually kept it the same across our heirlooms, so we planted at three inches within a row between plants. Um, however, yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure. Okay. Um, did someone say what website there was about a thresher? Was that the WSU website? Um, yeah, I believe it's WSU. I don't know. I was fiddling around the other day and I found it on there. Okay. Um, um, someone um, commented that they recommended Rancho Gordo in California as a good source of heirloom beans. Um, Rancho Gordo, okay, yeah. cool. And um, then um, another comment about how um, virus, um, especially um, BCMV, is a primary limiter to heirloom yield. Mm -hmm. um, so thanks for those comments. Um, let's see, do you have any comments on the germination rate for heirloom beans? Um, yeah, we experienced quite a bit of problems with germination and therefore ununiform stands. Uh, however, I think that might be due somewhat to the disease, seaborne diseases, um, because I don't, uh, our planting conditions this past year were, were quite nice, so I don't think it had to do anything with um, overly moist soil or anything like that. But germination is a big issue so far. But that's pretty much all I can comment on at the moment. Okay. Um, someone typed in the um, website um, where you can find information about a thresher. So thank you very much for that. And I just typed that into the chat box. So um, yeah, that's that's hopefully helpful to people who want to learn more about that. So um, let's see. We've got quite a few more questions coming in. Um, well, and if you don't mind, oh, we just sure. ended up looking up kind of the planting rates here. Um, and so for the black beans, we have 45 pounds per acre 
um, at a, and then the seeding then would be 105,000 an acre for the black beans. Similar for the uh, navy beans and pinto beans were just a little bit less at 90,000 an acre. Okay. Um, let's see, what nutrients are you going to be looking at um, for the heirloom beans? Um, nutrients. Uh, we're going to actually be running some um, near-infrared spectrophotometry, NIR, um, on the beans. And we're actually going to be looking at primarily the amino acid composition. I think protein is a really big thing that um, consumers are looking into. However, we'll also look at carbohydrate structure and um, perhaps fiber structure as well. Okay, um, this one's for Hannah. Um, you mentioned the connection to culture and or region in heirlooms. Do you think consumers would accept modern beans that have the appearance of the heirlooms? Can people tell the difference between Black's turtle soup and Zorro, for example? I don't think your average consumer would be able to tell the difference. Um, but what makes heirlooms great is that they have a story, and the story is really what connects the consumer to the food product. Um, so I guess you could cheese and give them the wrong bean, but that would take the, the truth out of the story, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but it, it's definitely something I've, I've had to grapple with about how, how far do you, do you try to improve heirlooms really without interfering with the integrity of these beans because because they have such a historical cultural significance and are connected in in certain populations and cultures um, I'll just have to figure it out on my own I guess <laughs> um, here's a question about how you managed bean beetles organically or did you not have problems with insects I had very few problems with insects actually um, knock on wood I guess, but um, I think our two biggest problems in Minnesota would be white flies and thrips, and thrips were um, uh, not quite as prevalent, but white flies were definitely out there, especially later in the season. Uh, but we, you know, I didn't see many bean beetles. I don't know about you, Claire. Yeah, no, we didn't have uh, insect pressure problems either. Uh, you can have problems with potato leaf hoppers, and we did not observe is issues with those. Okay. Um, can you recommend other um, region-specific studies, um, for example, in the Northeast, um, or any good universities from which to seek additional dry bean information around the country? I know we had a question from Texas. Um, someone um, sent in a link to organic variety trials at Michigan State, which I typed into the chat box. But if you have any recommendations for other um, universities around the country that are studying this that might have variety trials, um, people would like that. Um, I think we've kind of hit, hit them. Um, WSU, I know, is uh, working specifically with some heirlooms, especially trying to get them in the northwest region of the state. Um, OSU, I think, primarily focus on green, focuses on green beans. So they might have a little bit of research going on out there. Uh, UC Davis um, has quite a large be bean breeding program. Um, might be worth looking into. In terms of southern southern constituents, I'm not not quite sure if I know many useful sources. But and then okay. Michigan State, of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. Um, all right. Um, do you have experience with the cross-slot no-till system or any no- or low-till cult cultivation systems for organic growing? Uh, no, we do not. Um, although uh, this coming year we're going to be um, experimenting with some no-till systems. Um, the obvious challenge of this um, um, is is the weed control and and those folks who are using herbicide conventional systems um, have some real advantage here but uh, the weed control uh, feature is one that uh, is uh, challenging what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at a rye cover crop that uh, will be mowed 
and uh, attempt to seed into that. And because of the lateness of the seeding of the uh, dry beans, about the 1st of June here, the rice should be in antesis or should have hit antesis so that we ought to be able to kill it by mowing. Um, so that's going to be in a, something we're going to experiment with this year. Uh, we've talked also about a system that may involve uh, pennycrest, a relatively new oil crop, um, maybe relay uh, seeding into that. But uh, no, we haven't tried uh, tried the no-till system. Okay, um, we had a co couple of comments. Um, one that organic bean variety trials are published at the Washington State University website, which um, we already typed into the chat box, um, and also that um, Dr. Brick at Colorado State has also oh, done yeah. some research mm -hmm. in this area. So probably if you Google Colorado State um, bean variety trials, um, you might come up with some information there. And then um, I think we mentioned North Dakota earlier too, but make sure you do check out NDSU's bean breeding program. They've got quite an extensive program up there too. Okay, great. Um, did you use an inoculant um, planting the heirloom beans? We did. Actually, for both the market class and the heirloom beans, we used uh, com commercial inoculant, which was approved um, by our certifier. So it is um, good to go for organic systems. Okay. And some of our uh, work that uh, we have ongoing, which we didn't talk about today and is part of our USDA grant, we are going to, uh, we've already taken soil samples and trying to identify uh, superior rhizobium to use in an improved inoculant. We've taken soil samples of ongoing, ongoing uh, trials of soybeans as well as uh, field beans in Minnesota and we're trying to from those identify an improved uh, rhizobium. Okay, um, I think we have time for one more question here. Um, we have a couple of questions about combines here. Um, one is, do organic green bean growers have to have a combine to extract the beans? I think extracting the beans from the pods might require an organic processor certification in addition to a grower's certification. Do you have any knowledge of that? That, that's true. In organic systems, the, the certification process has to, has to be present in all parts of the supply chain. So yes, if, if you are um, harvesting on the farm and then sending off for processing or threshing, then you, the processing facilities need to be organic, organically certified. Um, so if you're planning to do a small portion of your farm as organic, you need to be sure that um, you have separate equipment or ha can document cleaning of the equipment so that it is prepped for organic harvest. Does okay. that answer the question? Well, I'm not sure. I think the question was whether you would have to have a processing um, certificate um, in addition um, to um, the organic grower certification. If you were to do it on farm, mm -hmm. I, I'm assuming. Yeah, that um, was the question. Mm -hmm. I think that is included with your certification, but please don't quote me on yeah, that. You would want to contact your certifier change. about exactly. that. Exactly. It might change between certifiers. Okay. Yeah, check your local certifier about that. Um. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the questions. Um, we're running out of time, but if you would like to ask additional questions after the webinar, um, please feel free to use the Ask an Expert service. So thank you very much, um, Tom, who unfortunately had to um, leave to his next workshop um, a little early, um, Hannah, Craig, and um, Claire for speaking to us today and answering the questions. And thanks to everyone for joining us.